Okay, welcome back to the uh, second session of the uh, Vice Chancellor's Teaching and Learning Forum. Um, what what we have now is a a panel session um, by the uh, the staff panel, uh, and and what the the question asked really was, what are the best practices in learning and teaching at USP? Um, and we're going to follow that after lunch by the student panel, which we're going to ask a slightly different question uh, of, which are, are students learning the positives and challenges? And hopefully what we'll be able to get from the two panel sessions is a, is a, a real idea of what the congruence or otherwise is between the staff and the student perspectives of some of the new uh, learning technologies and broader issues as well. So uh, I'm really hoping that this will be an interactive panel session that we, we don't spend all the time talking uh, to the audience, but that we do spend some time afterwards and, and we've left plenty of time in the, in the schedule for there to be questions and answers. And I've asked each of the uh, panel members to speak just for 10 minutes uh, to give their uh, viewpoints on the best practices and learning and on learning and teaching at USP. Um, there's a large number of people here, so I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to introduce them all uh, myself, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves as they uh, as they speak. Um, so we'll go from left to right. And the first uh, pair, we've got Dr. Salaniatha Bakalevu, who's the Associate Dean, Learning and Teaching in the Faculty of Arts, Law and Environment, and Mr. P uh, Peter Tuasawawawu, hope that I didn't slaughter that too badly, um, from uh, Emelus campus. And if you would like to start off, please. Thank you. Um, members of uh, SMT, uh, colleagues and students here on Lavala campus and uh, our visitors from the Ministry of Education. Um, and also um, colleagues and staff who are tuning in, colleagues and students who are tuning on from across the region. We want to welcome particularly uh, our colleagues on MLS campus, <coughs> Professor Colvin and uh, lecturers and students of the School of Law. I mentioned them because uh, from Fale, I am uh, presenting this uh, the Pali presentation with uh, Peter Tuisawau, who's the instructional designer on MLS campus. Peter was to have presented from MLS, which would have been excellent, but he's here, so uh, that's even better. When the, the, the consultants were here for the CFL review a couple of weeks back, they visited MLS campus and uh, one of the activities that uh, was presented to them was Peter, uh, giving them a demonstration of some of the good things that they're doing in the all, uh, on, online courses at, uh, in the School of Law, uh, especially in, in, the, in terms of interactive components, uh, the use of forum, and choice features that they were using. I'm told that uh, the consultants were impressed with the quantity and the quality of interactivity in some of those forums. That's why we are privileged. I'm very happy that Peter is here to share some of those in some of the slides that we will go into. But um, thinking about, or can I just correct, it's finally Faculty of Arts, Law and Education, not Environment, you said Environment. <laughs> when we're talking about uh, the titles, he mentioned about the titles of the presentations today, ours uh, on best practices and what we're doing right, and later on in the afternoon, um, the the students um, and about um, whether they are learning. I couldn't resist picking up one of my best um, cartoon strips. I know it's university, but cartoon strips are, are, are an all time great. And that's the one um, that I use for, with teachers all the time. And particularly, um, they generate different viewpoints about learning and teaching. And I think I heard this morning that particularly as we are moving towards more the e-learning modality, the, the, the new the changing roles of teaching and teachers. And, and when, when I use this, I usually come up with different subtitles for this one. Um, for this one, for today, that I want to use that title. Can there be teaching without learning? 
And I'm sure by the end of today, we will get some responses, particularly in the afternoon, from students regarding that. But I would like to focus on one of the only one of the characters in that cartoon strip. That one. The one who's saying, where is the evidence? And for us, therefore, the evidence is in quality outcomes. Because that third character uh, represents the many people who have a stake in what we do. In teacher ed, the teachers and, and uh, the principals and the community for students is would-be um, um, employers, um, scholarship providers. Just the community at large were looking to us for, for evidence. And we talk about quality outcomes, uh, quality programs, uh, the STAR activities uh, over and over again, and we are going through those again. This morning, transformative pedagogies that we're into uh, you know, for us at Terek. We have uh, a teacher's educational and e-learning uh, resources center where we are trying. We haven't got there. MIT is way, way ahead, but we are trying to get there and we're looking for IT champions. We're looking at um, IT um, enhanced teaching. And there is quality in the student support and fit for purpose assessment. In our presentation, we will look simply at two items, student learning support, and in student learning support, well, it's important for us because that's where teachers collaborate with student peer mentors. It's not about one group, it's about them working together to improve quality of learning and e-facilitation that uh, Peter will, will come in for. This doesn't mean that the schools are not doing anything. The other schools are not doing anything, far from it. All the schools are doing a lot. And hopefully next time when there's another forum, we'll talk about what's happening in the other schools. Student forums are very, very important. Very important because that's where student voices are heard. That's where they have their say. We had one of these uh, recently. It was special because it was full house, just students. And they were listening to their senior peers talk about what the uh, their senior peers thought about graduate attributes. This is moving graduate attributes to students. Do they believe in the graduate attributes? This is student outcomes. And so, for a while, I, I want you just to listen to what one of the mentors talked about. She's talking about her take on two graduate outcomes, specific consciousness and critical thinking. Had it not been for my critical thinking, though, I would not have been more appreciative of Pacific cultures the way I am now. I admit I understood other cultures existed, but being able to critically think about the stories from these other cultures allowed me for more information. Learning never stops. I still to this day seek information of cultures and relevant information from other sources aside from books. My primary source is, of course, and it will be, a book. But that doesn't necessarily mean yours has to be the same. I intend to continuously seek answers to all my questions and I hope that one day I will become a true master of critical thinking and more grateful of Pacific cultures. Two other items from, uh, from student learning support about peer mentoring. Um, this is the, the support that, uh, that peer mentors provide for students who seek help with any one of the courses that um, they need help in. And in, in this uh, program, we focus particularly on 200 and 300 level courses. For semester one, um, we, we, uh, we used the, the services of three peer mentors, and these two of them were for the School of Law and one for the School of Education. They worked with so many students in 12 courses, and the highest number of uh, uh, men mentees were from the School of Law, and so the School of Law recorded the high number of mentoring sessions, and that's probably why we're going to see hear more from the School of Law later on. And you see in there that uh, the good thing about this is that um, the high percentage of pass rates in all the courses, they're not claiming, uh, the, the peer mentors are not claiming much, but the interesting thing here is that the course coordinators are working in collaboration with peer mentors to raise the quality of passes. And, and the pass rates increase dramatically for all the courses that uh, receive peer mentoring. The other one is the PASS program, peer assisted study sessions. Um, this program targets courses with high attrition rates and therefore they focus mainly on the 100 level courses. Uh, 
past at USP, he's accredited and the past at the University of Wollongong. Again here, we notice that um, the pass rates increased dramatically for, for all the courses and 90% of, there were 97% passes in all the courses. All passes recorded improved pass rate between 70 to 100%. And this is very good considering that these are courses that uh, have, normally have high attrition rates. In all of this, the main thing is that students are, uh, student mentors are working closely with course coordinators. Thank you, Dr. Mbakalem. I think I've got two minutes to share all of this. But uh, first of all, uh, I think Helen Menard should have been here to present this. And my apologies to especially the, uh, the lawyers listening in from uh, Vanuatu and here in the room if I butcher some of uh, or make mistakes talking about some of the more technical things. Helen Menard. Uh, uh, teaches civil procedure, which is a dry top, uh, topic, and she used uh, simple uh, forums, Moodle forums and groups in Moodle to try and uh, uh, get her students to learn, learn uh, civil procedure. Uh, she tried to bring a dry uh, topic to life uh, by using a medium that is uh, uh, one of the uh, best mediums of learning and one that is probably suited for the region. It's, it's probably the, the main medium that we learn through the region, learning by doing, or have always done that. Um, what she did in her course was uh, had her students uh, choose their, their firms. If you look at the ground level of a law building, there's a, a choice feature where students chose their, their law firms and I've cut down the numbers of law firms here. There's, there were actually 16 law firms. So in level one, in, uh, in those law firms uh, are students discussing the scenario that she gave them. Uh, so they all had to be, one law firm would, would be a plaintiff, work for the plaintiff, and one law firm would be for the defendant. And she had uh, a, a forum as a senior partner in trade just before I carry on with that, uh, Helen wasn't the first person to use uh, virtual law forums. Sunita Boy Singh was the, probably the first uh, lecturer to start using this. And because they're good friends, Helen took that on and improved on it by making a senior partner in trade. Uh, because one thing that Sunita always complained about when students complain uh, about some things, uh, she had to go into the actual group forums to check to look for these things. But with a senior partner in trade, she didn't need to worry about that. She waited for students to submit whatever. Uh, and then in the court registries, that's where uh, the group submitted their briefs and whatever towards, uh, towards each other. And uh, she, as we will see later, uh, tried to sort those out. In the, this particular one, uh, this is a um, correspondence in the virtual law firm. Law firm you can see a student uh, in character talking about, she's saying hi councils, so they're, they're in character. She's attached a, a, a file in there where she's merged all their inputs of the different members of the firm and she's asking one of them to file it in the registry. So there's interaction student to student with the content. Here in the senior partner in tray, another student is asking the senior Council, which is the lecturer, Helen Millard, uh, asking him for advice. And then in the court registry, there's a whole lot of stuff that um, uh, the students have come up with in their law firms and now they've submitted uh, in the court registry. Um, this is some of the feedback that, uh, that was given, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And I think we'll wait until the end and have a discussion on all the panelists, if that's okay. So the, the next speaker, just going in line along the table, would be uh, Associate Professor Mahanti, the Associate Dean for Fac uh, Faculty of Business and Economics. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, so my presentation as we see the best practices in learning and teaching at the USP. So my 
outline or presentation. I'll go for brief introduction and best practices of uh, teaching and learning. How do they help? And two perspectives I'm going to touch. The basic elements of best, uh, best practices and teaching and learning and what are the best practices we are following in USP and the faculty and some concluding remarks. Going to the introduction, already so much we have heard in the morning and uh, you know, no doubt transformation is taking place. Global learning and teaching transformation, educational technological transformation, ICT revolution. And more importantly, there is a paradigm shift we have heard, teacher-centered to learner-centered or student-centered. That is the main focus in this uh, world of transformation. So how do best practices help? First thing, to motivate the learners, to develop passion for learning, to engage the learner actively in learning, as we have heard, active learning, that is the main focus, and ultimately to achieve institutional growth and excellence, which we are uh, uh, hankering for. So the two perspectives in this, no doubt, student perspective and teacher's perspective. We heard also from Professor uh, Vijay Kumar in the morning today. The student perspectives to learn, think, debate upon, and achieve. And to engage in learning activities rather than passive receiver of knowledge, that's what we have been hearing. And to interact with others, to construct from new concepts, ideas, and ask questions. That should be the focus. And you should be output driven, output oriented. And to become a lifelong learners. These are the, and then we can say that best practices are being happy. And from the teacher's perspective, providing the active learning opportunity, that also we heard in the morning from Professor Kumar, meet the individual student needs and teachers today as the main facilitators of learning. That's what also we heard about. And they have to give the constructive feedbacks. So to me, that as we see, that whole question of basic practices revolve around two basic elements, that is curriculum development, and assessment out outcomes. These are the two fundamental elements in best practices. So if you can cover these in the best way, then we are doing the best practices. So what do we mean by, what are the kinds of curriculum development we are looking for? It has to be balanced, it has to be integrated, it has to be relevant, rigorous, and responsive. And in terms of assessment outcomes globally, I'm just uh, taking this model as only in the by given by prayer, in teaching and learning, best practices in teaching plus more student involvement is equal to best learning outcomes, which can lead to assessment learning cycles, and then further improvements can be made, and that cycle continues. So here is the cycle of assessment learning that we have to define the intended learning objectives and measure in the second step major selected learning outcomes. And then you compare the outcome with intended objectives and then redesign our program and improve learning. So that cycle continues, then we can achieve the best practices in this, uh, if we achieve this cycle. That's what we have been doing in USP and that's the best practices. Some of the best practices which you are doing here in USP. No doubt, first thing I must say that diversity and multiculturalism in terms of student and staff, both promoting active learning and making USP as a unique center of tertiary learning in regionally and internationally. We have multimodal teaching deliveries, multi methods teaching and learning like satellite tutorial, audiovisual, M learning, all this coming up. These are the best practices we are following, no doubt, as compared to many other universities outside Pacific region and uh, use advanced ICT tools, USP Net, which is no doubt we are focusing on Moodle platform and so much. And when you see curriculum development, which has to be balanced, integrated, relevant, rigorous, and responsive, that also we are following here. And we are developing our curriculum ma mapping and teaching learning award, as we have seen two persons got our today. So that is the best practice we are following as compared to many other kind of, uh, universities outside. And it has to be inclusive learning process. You must be also following that. But disadvantaged social groups, particularly persons with disabilities, now it's their inclusive learning process is inbuilt in our system at USP. And in terms of assessment outcomes, we have course, program, institutional graduate outcomes we are talking about. And today morning also we heard from Professor Kumar 
We are talking about formative as summative, and that is being again inbuilt in our uh, system in USP. We, when you are talking about formative assessment, we are talking about assessment for learning. When you are talking about summative uh, assessment, we are talking about assessment of learning. So it is for learning and of learning that what we have, we are using that. That is the best practices. Moodle grade book, student evaluation survey, these are uh, external review and assessment programs and quality auditing and assurance, all these things which we are doing, that's the best practices we are doing here in USP. Coming to our faculty, what are the faculty is doing uh, in the, oh, no doubt we have all these uh, multi methods of teaching and learning and linking all these to USP graduate outcomes. We have been different across the schools in faculty, we have tier, team and peer teaching and learning process, cohort teaching, and a research linked and research enhanced teaching and learning, particularly in the, some of the postgraduate programs, we are following that, which is also best practices, which we are following at the faculty level. Group discussions, seminar presentations, interactive sessions so across the schools, Moodle and online forum discussions, peer observation, class visits, field uh, visits, particularly uh, tourism and uh, hospitality management and land management and development, they are following on all these uh, all good things that the students are learning from the real world situations. Guest lectures, industry exports lectures, and more importantly, inter-school debate series. That is very much very active and our, I'm in, the, in our faculty, and I must say that we are also getting response from outside, all debate series we are, and, and we are participating outside also, not only at the faculty, but at the university level. So other practices, like student learning support systems, mentoring, one-to-one on -one consultation, academic reading, skill enhancement, it's happening in, across the faculties, the, the university level, more importantly in our uh, faculty, time management session, goal setting session, assignment planning, all these sessions from time to time workshops have been conducted at the uh, faculty level. And similarly, if the first year experience uh, situation, we had a probation students workshop to know what are the problems the probation students they are facing. So that's also another good thing we are doing at the faculty level and course coordinators meetings, particularly the first year student. What are their problems? Coordinators, they have to pinpoint, then we can strategize what to do, what not to do. And we have faculty student association, particularly the accounting and finance student association, economic student association, tourism and hospitality student association, TASA, APSA, and ESA. They are doing good job, at least involving our students. So some of the mechanisms and uh, for teaching and learning practices evaluation, we have student evaluation survey and feedback of the courses, tutorial visit reports, internal teaching reviews by this way, uh, class visits, peer review, and regional campus director's reports on delivery of courses, what, how we are doing, not doing, and course outline auditing, student evaluation responses, and teaching staff action plan. These are the, some of the mechanisms we have to evaluate ourselves. And assessments, no doubt, across the university and also in the faculties, we have all these uh, marking schemes and rubrics with regular feedback. Fit for purpose assessment, which is followed by tourism and hospitality man management, marketing plan, business plan, menu planning and designing, these are all fit for purpose assessment, which is also a good thing we are doing at the faculty level. Team and cooperative learning with self and peer assessment, again followed by tourism and hospitality management. To conclude, I must say there is a need to change learning and teaching dynamics to respond to global transformation which we are doing, technological changes is uh, happening, and competitions to achieve, to move from good to excellence. And the best practices in teaching and learning are effective practices which you have been talking about and Vice Chancellor has already pointed out, and that is measured through learning design and learning analytics which we are, lots of data now, and we are analyzing that. The best practice is the outcome-based teaching and learning. It has to be outcome-driven and with greater student involvement. That is the active learning process. I'll just conclude by saying Benjamin Franklin, by quoting this Benjamin Franklin, who said, tell me, and I forget. Teach me, and I may remember involve me and I learn. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Mahanti, for a very uh, broad overview there of the FB best practices. And next, I'd like to ask the Dean of the Faculty of Science, Technology and Environment, and it is environment this time, I think, yes. uh, Angela Jokin to, uh, Dr. Angela Jokin to uh, give her. Thank you very much, Elise, and um, hello to all those um, watching and listening from outside of Lodala, outside of this room. Um, I'm filling in for my associate dean who is on duty travel, so I will try and do justice to all his hard work. Essentially, I have to apologize before I begin um, because uh, I took a slightly different approach. I thought it was about, and it is my error, I'm sure, um, it was about um, learning. What is it about? Yeah rather than about best practices. So our, our students' learning was my approach. So if I'm a little off track, please forgive me. But I will not mention everything the other two um, colleagues from the other faculties have mentioned because we are all doing that. So that, to me, is a given. What I would want to talk about, essentially, is what we are doing and how we're measuring what we think um, is student learning. And then I'd be very curious to hear the students' point of view about whether they really think they're learning. So that was the idea of, of this presentation. So how do we measure learning? I guess overall performance in a course at the end of the day is what tells you, you know, how well somebody's learning. And of course, three main ingredients of learning is the support that's provided, the enabling environment, and absolutely necessary commitment by the learner. Um, I'll just take one example of uh, last semester. These are the things we did in addition to the normal day-to-day -day teaching. So this was the extra support that we provided. And I wanted to share some data with you to see how effective some of these have been in bringing about learning. Right. At risk students, as you know, our regulations demands that we get these students by week seven or so and then do something to help them. So the at risk students identified was about 523 last semester. Oh no, sorry, 1390 last semester in all of these courses. And these were given um, extra support, remedial classes, so on and so forth. And you can see that in some courses it was quite effective in terms of bringing the percentage pass of these groups of students quite significantly. Of course, there are those that were not so efficient, and we are trying to analyze to say why. But where they have been effective, these students would otherwise have failed. Um, we know that you know, if 80% if or 70% of these potentially failing students have actually passed, then the faculty feels that that's successful um, learning going on. I think week four, week five, this uh, first semester, we received a whole bunch of students from the Solomon Islands who were late registrants. And in these particular courses, we had the denominators here tell you how many students we had. And we took them through special remedial sessions one-on-one, one-on-small-group kind of things, particularly with the lecturers themselves or teaching assistants. And we found that, you know, these students, most of them had 50% or above pass rate. These students would have been bound to have failed. We know that we don't, as a rule, take students in after week two in, in FSTE because we know the failure rate is extremely high. So something good's going on there. Probation students, we were given a probation list in uh, February this year. We contacted them, each one of them individually, got them together. And again, the denominators here tell you how many students there were in these courses. And we found that, again, homing in, going one-on-one, -on -one, supporting these students throughout the semester, most of them actually had, but most of the courses had more than 50% pass rates. These students otherwise were unlikely to have returned. 
peer mentoring, all faculties do this, and peer mentoring I think is a hit. It's every time it shows that peer mentoring works. And you can see a percentage of, there is one, one thing to note though for peer mentoring that uh, we encourage um, students who need support, but students who don't need support wish to get peer mentoring, we don't stop them. So it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. And here, of course, it's either one mentor and one student or one mentor and a, and a couple of students. And it's a very um, sort of one-on-one -on -one special mentoring. And this is what peer mentoring um, essentially provides the students. The use of the smart, uh, our smart classroom is, uh, seems to be growing. Kids like to sit in that, uh, on that round table and you know, work away all together and see things happening. So that's catching on fairly quickly. Pass again. Pass is like uh, my colleague earlier said, is really for the really difficult causes. And these are traditionally very difficult causes with low pass rates. And you can see that um, this is your control where these students don't, um, are not involved. You can see that as the number of sessions in pass increases, one to four, five to nine sessions don't make any difference as such, but above 10, you can see there's significant improvement. And in the special thing about pass is your mentor takes the show. They, they design the learning things, they organize their plans, they work with the students, as opposed to the, the peer mentoring, which is much more structured, and we work with the um, with the lecturers there. So this is a much more free, you know, do what you want kind of learning. Remember, none of this is compulsory for any students. Of course, we have the early warning system. I'll talk a bit more when we actually look at the analytics of the learning early warning system. But the good thing about this is students have always shown a very positive response because, you know, you'll keep getting messages about when something is due or you're, you're not up to par with the other students and all that. It is your personal interactive uh, mechanism which is working. Be in, be, I'd be very curious to hear what the students have to say about this one, whether they think it's, it's effective or not, although our surveys show that they seem to like it. So essentially those were the things that the Dean of FST thinks the students are, <laughs> the students are actually learning from, but um, we are very, very keen, my colleagues present here, to hear from the students later. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for um, uh, highlighting some of the issues and actually um, discussing some of the things that hopefully we can discuss more later. And uh, I, like you, will be very interested to see what the students have to say later about what the, what the real uh, 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 activities are that they feel that are really working for us or for them. Uh, next, I think, now that you've sat down, I've uh, lost track of where we're at, but I think it's, yes, it's uh, Aidan, Aidan Thorne, uh, who's the director of the College of Foundation Studies, who will give the perspective of CFS, if you, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, welcome, colleagues from Laudala and from the region. Um, I've chosen to call this CFS in the region because it's made, been made abundantly clear to me by the region directors and many of our teachers there and campus coordinators, but that's how they view the college. Um, our programs, foundations and preliminary are represented in every campus across the region. And when I put these figures together, it really rather stunned me. We're currently this semester working with six and a half thousand students, um, campus-based students around the region. Um, that excludes the students who are coming from 40 secondary schools around the region. We don't actually deal with the teaching of them, but we do a lot of the admin and a lot of all of the marking of their scripts, exams and assignments. As you can imagine with figures like that, that is one of our huge problems. And I knew that when I first took this job on, when I looked at the sheer size of the area that we had to cover, that the logistics were going to be the main issue. Um, to give you an idea of some of the departmental sizes, our language department is dealing with over 5,000 scripts at the end of each semester at the moment. 
the maths department is having to do with 3,500. So dealing with that on a central basis and actually catering to the teaching needs of all of those students, I think, has been a huge issue. Um, what have we basically been doing this year? The first thing that we've been doing to try and cater for the, the learning and teaching needs of the region, rather than just Laudala, is we've recruited 20 full-time TAs for regional campuses. So we are building teaching teams in each of the campuses. We are looking for continuity. We're looking for quality. We've been relying on part-time teachers until now, and we've had a sort of yo-yo results effect up and down as people come and go. I'm hoping that over time, these full-time teaching teams will be able to put an end to that. Um, we've recruited two new campus coordinators. These are key people for us because they will coordinate the work of the teams of full-time TAs on the ground. They will work with the students within the campuses as well as helping coordinate our new associate director with the schools-based programme. I would see the school-based programme as growing across the region. There seems to be significant interest in it. Um, other areas that we've been working on is we have moved all of our marking now for the exams um, out into the region. We coordinate from here. We send either a TA who's very qualified and experienced or a subject coordinator to manage and work with teams of part-time markers that we recruit from the regional schools. Um, we have just started creating a very strong working relationship with the Ministry of Education Curriculum Advisory Service. Um, and we see that as being fundamental over the next few coming years. They've already earmarked several areas that um, they want us to work with them on. They want help from us and vice versa. There are things that they can help us with. For example, we've decided that we, we need to take a completely new approach to orientation in the College of Foundation Studies and we need to try and get into the Form 6 and 7 school classrooms well in advance of the end of the year so we can start the familiarization process with what it means to be a learner here in USP. Um, along with FST and I presume the other faculties, we are monitoring attendance. We've got some of our courses are working with the early warning system. We're also getting all of our TAs uh, and teachers to submit attendance lists every week and we are following up on students who regularly are not attending for whatever reason we're finding out and we're offering remediation. It seems to have had a significant impact on um, attendance in the classes across the subject areas now and I'd be interested to see what students have to say about that later. We're also offering advice where it's necessary um, and trying to find pathways to try and alleviate student problems where they crop up. We're providing a considerable number of consultation hours. Our subject coordinators' doors are always open. Um, and students, I, I see students in there regularly now, so I think that's beginning to pay off. We do a lot with field trips. These are not just extras to the courses, they're built into the courses. They're an integral part of the assessments that we do. Um, we send students out um, largely from the economics department. They've been going to various farms, factories, um, just to see what, what life is, is really like out there in terms of the economics. Um, we bring people in. For example, down here, you can see there's, a, there's an example of somebody who's come in from the Federal Reserve Bank to talk to the economics preliminary and foundation students. I see that as a, as a sort of growing area for us. We also try to use a lot of oral presentations as an assessment activity. And I, I find that the students I, I see who've done this end up being far more confident, um, able to speak in public with their peers. Uh, and it's certainly something that they enjoy doing. Feedback's been very positive for that. Along with the others, we have been very much following the, the learner outcomes mode from USP. Um, we are changing our, our modes of assessment practices. Um, 
we're building a lot more portfolios and projects in. We're trying to cut down on the number of end of year exams, end of semester exams, because I think they're very stressful. Uh, we're certainly look, working very closely with FSTE on, on the sciences and what we're doing in terms of course review and assessments. Um, feedback I've had from the students is at the moment that there is quite a heavy stress level in terms of the sheer volume that they're having to deal with. One of the other things we're doing, and this is fictitious data by the way, is we've been working very closely with FSTE on this and it's something that we'll be spinning out across the rest of the faculties as part of our feedback. Because we're trying to work with the students, trying to get to know the students, who they are at a very early stage. Um, we're looking at where they come from. We have multiple entry points. We're looking at how many of those people actually make it to the exams, how many of them pass or how many of them fail. And we pass this data along, along with lists of names of at a slightly deeper level uh, borderline passes, because these are the ones that we see as possibly having problems in year one courses, and they need to be picked up. So this is the type of thing that we're presenting with now. And I think it's something that the staff are beginning to take on board in terms of a need to actually talk with the assessment results and talk with the students and pass the information along but in a very visual form. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aidan, for that perspective from the College of Foundation Studies. And finally, uh, I have to uh, thank Aroni Radule for, uh, for standing in for Theresa at very late notice, so the Acting Dean of uh, the uh, Centre for Flexible Learning, who uh, couldn't make it because she's ill, so uh, Aroni, thank you for, uh, for coming and giving her presentation. Uh, greeting colleagues, uh, to those of you tuning in from the region, I'll be Bolo so uh, what we'd like to present today is uh, on the issue of orientation, the, the importance of orientation in uh, teaching and uh, learning. So hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll be able to tie this in to the, to the, theme, of the, to the theme of this uh, panel discussion. Um, orientation, one would argue that uh, it's, it's really important. It's used in the employment industry. It's also used in the um, education industry. Here at USP, we, we sort of uh, uh, allocate one whole week prior to the semester. For, for orientation, and it it's reduces anxiety for someone who's transiting into a new environment. Uh, but for, for the purpose of this pre presentation, we'd like to argue orientation for online learners, uh, learners who are transiting from a, from a different mode, from a different mode of study, coming into online. So based on the literature uh, out there, I just managed to pick out uh, this quite a lot, but I, I want to focus on three points. Uh, one is... Uh, learner readiness uh, for, for online learning. So before uh, someone enrolls into an online course, they should know uh, the expectations of, of uh, online learning. And um, for that to happen, there's, there's supposed to be some sort of pretest before the learner actually enrolls. And once the, once the learner is uh, in the course, then there needs to be appropriate support. Uh, when I talk about support, I'm referring both to academic and non-academic support. So this was mentioned by Hughes from Arabasca University. And the uh, third point there, uh, Julie Salmon, very, for those of you who follow the literature on uh, e-learning, very famous uh, model that she prescribed, the five-stage model. I'll talk more on this in the next, uh, next slide. So um, in this case, I'm focusing on uh, U24, how they've uh, uh, transformed the face-to-face uh, -face orientation to online orientation. So initially, the, the, the orientation would occur via a drop-in consultation, where the students would uh, come in to meet the teaching staff and um, discuss issues regarding the course or clarify doubts that they have regarding the course. This would happen in the first uh, week of the, of the semester. And um, again, this, this turned out later into an amazing race. The concept it was developed by Jackie. And, um, this would continue into the second and third week of the semester where the students would be orientated to online learning and this would occur in the labs, the, the labs up here. And uh, again, the students would be oriented into the content and the online uh, pedagogy would, would be covered in, this con in these uh, sessions. And for the regional students, they were catered via the, the REACT sessions. So 
when when the course was actually uh, converted to online, we had to find a way to to capture this uh, face-to-face uh, orientation. And um, for that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in the next slide. But the question, why is uh, orientation so important? Again, it, I've mentioned this point already. The first point is the transition. And the um, second point there, no one is around to, to show the students the ropes. Um, they might be a facilitator, but it all depends on the availability of, of the facilitator. And uh, again, on um, Jilly Salmon's uh, five-stage model, uh, very briefly, the five-stage model uh, says that uh, on the first stage, the students uh, um, need to, be, to have access and be motivated. Uh, and the second uh, step is where the students begin the online uh, socialization. Probably the picture there is not too, not too big. You can look it up probably after this. Online socialization, this is where the concept of, uh, of uh, connectedness comes in. Third phase, or the third stage is the information exchange. Fourth stage is the knowledge construction, and the fifth stage is the development, or uh, some, some people refer to it as the looking back phase. So uh, I would argue that the orientation, or the online orientation, is uh, really important in order to get this, the students or on online learner through the first three stages of, of the model. Moving on. Now, the, as I mentioned, U24, we, we created something called the Amazing Race, or a game-based learning, a game-based approach to, to, the orientation, uh, to the orientation package. So why, why a game-based approach? Uh, firstly, to alleviate the information overload. This, the information uh, that's presented in this course is quite dense. And for, for students to, to sort of go through the whole thing, it needs to be done in a fun and innovative way so that it, it caters for that density. So, and then there are different stages in, uh, or checkpoints in, in the race. As you all know, the, the TV show, popular TV show, The Amazing Race, it has checkpoints. So this, uh, this race was developed uh, along those lines. So uh, the last point there, uh, the different stages are also curiosity and eagerness because um, we use the Moodle, we use, we, uh, first of all, we use Moodle to, to have to conduct this race. And the fact that we use a conditional activity, meaning that uh, the next phase of the race wouldn't uh, show unless you complete the conditions of the previous phase. Right? So what are the objectives of the race? Four main objectives. First one is to orientate students to the online environment. Uh, secondly, to answer most of the frequently asked questions. Um, my colleagues who in U24 could testify to this, that they get so many queries um, over the over the past offerings of the, of this course, and when we present the information prior to the actual uh, learning, students get to access the information, and then hence uh, the, the, the queries are answered right there and then before they actually uh, go into the content itself. Um, third uh, third point: uh, introduce students to the core Moodle tools using the course. As you know, uh, not everyone is tech savvy, so some some students need to be sort of re reintroduced into the tools. Uh, even after doing UU100. Uh, and the last point there, the purpose of the race is to develop uh, technical, social, personal skills that is required of an online learner. When I'm referring to personal skills, I'm referring to time management skills, uh, the ability to check emails and, uh, and, and all that, post on the forums and so on. Just a quick snapshot at the, the amazing race. It has four checkpoints. It's, uh, as I said, it, it's done in Moodle. It has four checkpoints. The four checkpoints are named after the Four capitals of the Pacific, Honiara, Pia, Taro, and Nukualofa. Because the course is Pacific Studies, it's also intended to introduce students to, to the different countries and their capital. And you, you see there, there's a mascot. Yeah. Because the, base, the game is based around the concept of, sorry, the course is based around the concept of a metaphorical canoe, Terese Tayo. Uh, Dr. Frank can elaborate on that. So this, so this is the first checkpoint. The first checkpoint is called Honiara, it's a simple page where students are expected to, to go through um, the resources available in, uh, in Moodle. So it's, the information is presented in, a, in book format. So this is where they get to uh, see who's the teaching staff. Uh, they go into the course information. They, they familiarize themselves with the concept of the VACA, or they, in U24, they use the concept of the VACA as, as the virtual groups, or the online groups. And uh, your learning platform, that's where they, they get to know about Moodle and uh, uh, how will I be assessed? It's an assessment package. You need help. This is um, a, a site or a section on the page that 
provides all the relevant supporting structures that's available here at the university, such as the SLS, uh, ITS, and so on, all centralized in, in one location. So once they're done with this, the next checkpoint will, will show, and the checkpoint is called up here. Um, it's a quiz, and it tests the students whether they've actually uh, gone through the resources in the previous uh, checkpoint and familiarized themselves with it. At the same time, it's, um, students, uh, students get to practice the actual quiz before they, this is not assessed. Eh? And uh, also the checkpoint is trying to contextualize the, the, the checkpoint to Apia. It has a, a small picture there of the downtown Apia and a local greeting. So these are the kind of questions that, that, you, that they expected to answer. And once they're done, they get this. The completion, completion bar appears. And thanks to Rajni, who provided the codes for this. And it's telling them what to do next. Fly to Taro, Kiribati, which is the, the next checkpoint. So the next checkpoint here is uh, Taro, Kiribati, which is the forum. Students get to engage in the forum. So at, at the same time, they are, the requirements of the forum is that they get to ask each other any relevant information that, that they felt was left out from the previous checkpoint. So this is where the engagement uh, continues. And at the same time, students learn how to post on the forum. And they, yeah, those, those who haven't posted on the forum will, will actually have to do this. Right? And then the last checkpoint is Nukalofa. This is where the students uh, practice how to upload an assignment. It's an assignment for a box. And also, uh, the requirements of this checkpoint is uh, students have to name the file so the technical skills comes in here. They have to name the file properly so that when, when lecturers go through it, uh, they don't have to sort of filter. But the, the file name is in the student's name. And also, in this checkpoint, uh, the students are required to copy and paste the postings from the forum, put it on a Word document, and then upload it here. So at the same time, it's teaching them this technical skill. And this is actually done in the course. So by the time they get to the actual course, this skill would have, they would have learned this from the orientation package. Just some feedback from the students. There were seven major themes emanating from this. Uh, I won't elaborate much on this, but I'd like to uh, I like the, the bar there in the middle, acquired skills for online learning. Um, most of the students uh, felt that uh, after completing the race, they, they've acquired the, the necessary skills that's required for online learning. Second highest there, 22.2% on the creative dissemination of, uh, of information. That's some of the feedbacks from the student. So just our last point there. It is good that you cannot move on to the next stage until you have completed the each stage. This way you fully understand. So again, it's a work in progress. And uh, probably we need to uh, do, uh, develop this further. Thank you. Thank you, Irani, for giving that uh, very interesting uh, presentation on, on, uh, on that work in progress. Can I get the panel members to please take their seats and uh, we'll take some questions from the floor. This is the uh, important part. I think this is the part where we can find out, you know, other things that can be learned from around the uh, university. And are there other things that we're not highlighting as best practices, perhaps, that, uh, that are out there in other places? So questions from the floor. Don't be shy. This is the point where you can engage in your <laughs> development of best practices at USP. You should be interested. I was interested in your comment about formative assessments, focusing more on formative assessments. Do you see a point where you'll do away with summative assessments? Yes. Oh, you couldn't see Yeah, I mean, do you see a point where you might not need to have any summative assessment. And it's interesting you raise that as an issue. We actually have um, one new course proposal that has been put in for a, a history course, a history foundations course, where all of the summative assessments, the aim is to remove them completely and just go with a formative assessment all the way through, reducing the content load at the same time so that we can focus on a lot more of the issues to do with understanding. Come on, don't be shy, you can't be. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question. After listening to the professor from MIT on his very engaging presentation 
on visualization simulation. I just wanted to ask, uh, in how many years time would VSQ reach that level where we can actually engage our learners and be provided with the tools to actually do that? Thank you. Dean, would you like to answer that one? Um, I think what, what was presented this morning was what happens at MIT. MIT obviously understands its learners. I think for USB, our first step is to really understand our, how our, our learners learn. And we are trying to do that. Um, we use Moodle as, as our learning uh, platform, and Moodle has a lot of things that we can do. I think there is a, um, you know, there are different views about how much graphics you need to use for learning, what kind of graphics and things. So graphics is just one aspect of learning. There are several other activities which engage students in learning. And I think it's very important for our staff to actually go and investigate with the help of, of the Moodle team exactly what kinds of learning activities and tools Moodle has that we can enhance. I think we had a very good presentation of how we can engage students on learning. So I mean, look, we can have this debate about, you know, what is good, good for our, our students, and um, it may not be the same model as what MIT has. Yeah? Oh, sorry. Yep, please. Yeah. Um, my question is to Dean FSTE. Um, this is related to early warning system, and I think it's an excellent tool. And I'm wondering if it is being applied by other faculties or all. Is there much uh, of a problem if we integrate it in all the courses? Um, with the early warning system, currently we have, uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming we actually have them, uh, we have some preliminaries going in the other faculty courses. We're doing a trial in the other two faculties as well with the permission working through the appropriate associate dean. So there are some courses. The only reason why I have hesitated to roll it out completely is we aren't quite there with what we want early warning system to do. Um, at the moment, it's used for a number of things. And you can't just put early warning system in a course which has, say, you know, which only has 30% online activities. It's not going to tell you very much about learning. It can tell you, which is how it's being used currently in many courses, about, well, you know, you're late for assignment and things like that. So we are developing it to the point where it can actually do the, you know, it can actually predict learning and I'll talk a little bit about it this afternoon, and that's when I think we need to then put it, you know, put it across the university. But it has to have, the course has, has to have a minimum amount of online involvement for early warning system to be effective. So I think we're taking small steps at a time, but we'd be very happy to work with individuals who wish to use it we can work you know, with, with you on how you want to use it, and we can implement it, can't we? Yeah, I see nods. Uh, Rachel, Shirley, but um, if anybody wants to make comments as well, I mean, it's not just about questions to the panel, but I mean, if you have comments from your own practices that differ from or, or, con or, or complement the, the practices that we've uh, had demonstrated, please um, do speak up. So, Rachel, Shirley, first. Thank you. I'd like to thank the panel for, a, for, a, for an excellent presentation and also Professor Kumar earlier this morning for a very um, mind-blowing, I should say, uh, presentation. I'd just like to make a comment uh, on behalf of students with disabilities that are enrolled in the university. And the comment is that we've been working uh, very closely with the faculties, associate deans learning and teaching, and also CFL and CFS and uh, student learning support in ensuring that students with disabilities are able to access uh, um, courses on Moodle, uh, uh, to do the workarounds uh, uh, around things like a video where a deaf student is not able to view a video. Um, and therefore, you need a little 
a little screen, split screen, where somebody is doing signing, etc. And um, we're like an early warning system in a way, in that we're, we're here now. Uh, the, the university now has a disability inclusiveness policy as of 10th April 2013. And we're sort of an early warning system in the sense that uh, once these students get to uh, know more and more about the policy, uh, we no longer can just have that negotiation space where we say, oh, in terms of reasonable accommodations, we can do this, we can do that, however we cannot do that. And my comment is, um, I thank the university for, for the, the disability inclusiveness champions already existing in the university, in the different faculties, in the different support sections, enabling these workarounds so that when a student who is deaf tries to access Moodle, we work, uh, uh, we've been working very uh, successfully with uh, staff at CFL, uh, the educational technology uh, uh, staffing uh, uh, um, experts there to ensure that they're able to access videos uh, or if a, if a blind student cannot read something that's pdf and it's on Moodle because the JAWS screen reader software cannot read that, we've, we've done our little workarounds. Or like uh, uh, what Dr. Mishra um, did for us, uh, one of our low, severe low vision student who was not able to do a spot quiz uh, uh, immediately because of the logistics behind arranging for that student to have her paper done through um, collaboration with the Fiji Society for the Blind, for her to opt for an oral uh, spot quiz. And uh, I'd like to just make the comment to say thank you to the university and for those that have been working with the Disability Resource Center in ensuring uh, that students with disabilities also are able not only to access your courses and your, your online as well as face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, offerings, but also to uh, work with us in, in having these workarounds. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we should thank you, Rachel, and the Disability Unit, because uh, the, the inclusiveness and, and the number of disabled students that we're able to cater for now has, has gone up uh, quite significantly since, since you started the unit. So uh, that's a really good initiative. Does anyone from the panel want to, to say anything on that one? No, they agree with you fully. Thank you very chilly. Any more questions or comments? Frank? Frank and then Sushil. Yeah, uh, the, the, my question is on, as a follow-up question uh, with the uh, summative assessment. Am I clear? Yes. Uh, the, the courses actually which have got the summative assessment and the courses without non-summative assessment, uh, how are they going to give the same kind of learning to the students? Uh, for example, in summative assessment-based courses, the students do prepare the courses very well from examination point of view and do the revisions, and then they, they do the assignment. Whereas in non-summative courses, they students do the assessment in small bits, and then they, they go to the next one, so thank you. Uh I see Could the I Dean, just, Dean is yeah. itching to answer yeah. this one, so I'll let you go again, but we must ask some other panel members to speak, please. It's just that uh, I think we need to be a little bit clear about the functions of the two kinds of assessment. Formative assessment is essentially about in the learning process. Summative assessment is the end product of what somebody's learned. And USB is just developing or is soon going to develop its assessment policy we are, as we speak, we're all working on the um, assessments. You know, we've got the STAR project with your curriculum maps, your learning outcomes. We're now at the assessment stage. So assessment is going to stay and assessment is going to be summative at USP until it makes another decision because that just completes the cycle of the entire STAR process. I just wanted, that was just the broad mm. outlook of, and those of us who've been training to for assessment um, with Jeff, we know that that's the next step that we are going. And, it's all, and, and it is a combination of um, formative and summative. 
One, one, of the, one of the issues that was raised this morning by Professor Kumar was that that, that speed of that turnover of the, the, the formative assessment is, is highly important in the learning process. Could maybe some of the other panel members tell us about are there any best practices at USB which are, uh, are aimed at really speeding up that turnover and, and formative feedback process? Phone a friend. If <laughs> Please. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure I understood fully the question, but I'll try to make a guess. Uh, uh, there are, um, for example, uh, in one of the law courses, um, there's weekly scenario-based online tests for students. Uh, the, assess, the feedback for those, you know, they're marked online, but the questions are... Um, are grey because it's law, so the, the lecturer has um, uh, gives feedback. The lecturer gives feedback through the video conferencing um, uh, tutorials that they that he has with his online students as well as his face-to-face -face students. Uh, so f to get around around that. So it's is that what uh, you were asking about? Um, could I just very quickly add to that? I think um, we all know that online assessments are the easiest, the quickest, and that's why we try and encourage that as much as possible. But uh, as part of the assessment policy, the university will have a minimum turnaround time for assessments, which is why we provide, based on student numbers, we provide funding for extra support so that the minimum, and we will actually monitor the um, the fact that you know, USP has now decided some time back that all courses will actually use the mark sheet on Moodle, it means that um, we will then be able to actually monitor to see compliance with the minimum turnaround time for the, um, for the assessment. So all that would factor in um, in that assessment policy. Okay, thank you. Frank? Uh, good morning. I'd like to thank Professor Kumar and our distinguished panelists. It's more a comment, and I must say I'm a little bit nervous because I don't want to spoil the party. I know the day is, is still young. Um, two issues I'd like to raise. The reality on the ground, uh, first of all, as a coordinator for U204, they are serious connectivity issues uh, with certain campuses. I hope that we'll be able to address some of those issues later this afternoon. Uh, the second issue, uh, Salah, who was on our board of studies yesterday for Pacific Studies, uh, the high ratio of instructor to student in U204, it's one to 90 on average. And we had a consultant, I forgot her name, who came twice, and who said that ideally the ratio should be a maximum of one to 30. So before we continue on with this fascinating discussion on online learning, we have to look at the reality on the ground, at least as far as U204 is concerned. Um, so just to be aware of those issues. Thank you. Thank you. I do need to respond to that. If you look at the framework for online course development, which we launched last year, and we sent out emails to staff, and we told, tell them exactly where it's sitting, it has a management strategy for managing online courses and that's very clear about how you manage and for those online courses with large numbers like UU100 this has never been a problem you just follow the guidelines in that and the issue of uh, large student staff ratio would not arise so may I suggest that the course coordinator actually goes and reads that guideline just follows it so it's not a problem of the policy, it's a problem of non-compliance. I think, and the broader issue I think from this morning is that also that, um, that the new technologies can assist with those issues. Um, and, and the new technologies don't all have to be online. You know, you can have those distributed, you can, you can have uh, virtual labs in a lab, you know, they can be, they can be uh, isolated uh, systems. So they don't have to be. So yes, we have problems with, with connectivity, but you don't have to have connection. 
for all of the sort of new uh, pedagogies that, we're, that, that are out there. So I think we do need to look at everything and, and try to come up with solutions for the problems that we have in the region. I mean, obviously, the, the connection issue is a, is a big one, and that's not something we can deal with here, but, I mean, we are slowly, uh, or, or quite rapidly, actually, now, uh, starting to get better connections through through the region, you know, with fibre going into into Solomon's, uh, for example, and that will make a, a sea change difference uh, within the next year or so. So, so I think there are some major changes that will come about, and we need to be prepared for those. But we also need to be thinking outside of the uh, the, the standard box. I think you know that you might see in in other areas where you know in the US the developments are heavily concentrated on, on connectivity, but we, not all the developments have to rely on connectivity. There are other things uh, that, that we can be doing, and I think the, lecture, the lecture this morning really did show that. Yes, please. Sorry. These are not the questions, just query to Dean of Science. So my understanding at the University of Fiji so when we calculate the points for a course for undergraduate, so we give the student 15 points for a course. The same practice we follow for business student, economic student, art student, as like that. But for science and engineering, they should deserve more points because they attend in the lecture, they attend in the tutor, they attend in the uh, lab. I made this query to my learning and teaching community at my university. They told in that case, we should charge double tuition fee if we increase the points. This should not be an excuse. So I believe we should treat our student with 30 credit points rather than 15. This is one query to you. Second one, as I mentioned in my uh, early morning question, so we should use technology as a supporter of, as a support tool for learning. Do USP provide all the lectures, video recording in the online mode? Yes or no? Sorry, I'll, I'll have to come back to your second question and probably to seek some clarification. Just on the credit points, I'm assuming that's what you mean. See, that there are different systems of determining credit points. The Bologna system determines credit points based on student learning hours, student workload. And I think the U.S., the, the more sort of United States and similar systems work on um, actual contact hours. So they're two very different measures of credits. USP, for example, uses the Bologna system, which is student workload, and it's very clearly um, defined as one credit is equivalent to 25 to 30 learning hours. And we've just done, um, we've just completed, I think, well, the initial 71 courses we've looked at, we've collected data on student, le student learning hours. I think we've got several more that we're analyzing now. And it shows very clearly that the hard sciences students have a much higher learning hours. So I agree with your um, point about the distinction between science and, and non-science courses. However, as, a, as an institution, one has to decide whether they want to then give appropriate credit points or they wish to bring them all to the same credit points, in which case they need to reduce student learning hours in the heavier courses. Right? USB as an institution has decided it will stay within the 888 structure of a degree and therefore, we will be working on the heavy courses to make sure that the learning hours are reduced to a level where it's equivalent to a non-science. Within the range, it's equivalent to a non-science course. So it's really up to the institution how they deal with the credit point thing. I think and it's also fair to say that that analysis showed quite a good um, relationship between the learning hours, um, the actual total learning hours, and what we were expecting from the credits. We, we actually weren't very far off when we did the workload survey. So, so it won't require a huge amount of, uh, of adjustment. So, so that's good news for USP anyway. Uh, John, uh, just one comment. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, this for my first time in the forum. But I'd like to make a few observations and comments. 
And uh, I've been very keen on what, on what you listen to the fact that I had a lot of uh, intimate, uh, what you call, uh, attachment to Murule as I faced, as I enrolled the university from the beginning of this. Now, uh, first of all, uh, since uh, you, uh, your, the, the system is probably quite new to the, to the academic pursuit, but uh, my, 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 my comment is this, uh, it's just a bit a kind of observation that I'm making is that uh, I hope uh, the program as such is not a shift away from the kind of hegemony that uh, you know, the social sciences and the other departments are trying to, to bring about. Uh, my, my fear is that, you know, like if the more we become imagined, like what Benedict Anderson says, is that, you know, we are shifting away from the very, from the very uh, concept of why the university was established in the first place. My own personal observation when I came to the university was that it has actually left focus on some of the issues where, you know, the university is supposed to be the, uh, the critic or the conscience of society. And uh, this is where, you know, uh, uh, probably uh, where we need, to do, we need to provide some justice in terms of the kind of the spheres of exchange that we have with a wider spectrum of the stakeholders which actually make up and actually contribute to the impact of this university. Now, I had a very bad experience when I came, quite frankly, I think probably it has been noted that uh, uh, my request to the faculty is that you know, if you can provide a level play for you everywhere, so that you, know, you can have a kind of a, a sphere which is probably you know, very friendly, not only really friendly, but uh, you know, uh, that everybody can actually respond. Now, <coughs> why I'm saying this is that because of the fact that you know, we are in the Pacific, and we have a lot of our own values that we would like to, you know, to have. But apparently, you know, as you are, as you all know, as academics, that you know, there's a there's a certain clash of this value because of the fact that you know that IT can has done a lot of damages to and fro. Now, I cannot be hypocritical on that, but just because of the fact that you know there are values that we need to enshrine, there are there, there are values that we need to carry on to our work. Younger generation, of course, in the sustainable environment, all this kind of stuff. Now, definitely, I'm sure, you know, Moodle was probably you know, brought about as a result of that, but to the extent that, you know, it diminishes the very essence of the, you know, the magnanimous, uh, you know, the thing that we have with one another, please can you be more, you know, uh, you know be more friendly in this. And uh, the other thing was that, you know, like I've noticed that um, not, all of, not all of us have access to Moodle. You know, it's, it's probably no, no good to talk about, you know, case studies in you know, situations like, you know, what my family always is saying, you know, based on observation, because, you know, people do see things from a different perspective. But my own, my own request to the academic staff is, is, is can you bring on, can you try to, you know, take into account the values of our specific cultures, you know, what we have. Because, you know, definitely not all these things can be incorporated into society. Thank you very much. Okay. Would any of the panel like to uh, comment on that? Stella? I just got a little bit of what you said at the end. And I'm, I, I, I guess you, you're talking about uh, the only thing that came into my mind is specific consciousness, which is an attribute of uh, uh, the, uh, the university and which we enculturate in our students. While we value the values of, the, of our people and in the region, we need to be mindful and we need to be forward-looking. We need to be looking at the international community so that we, we ensure that the students of this region have the broader focus. They, they can be marketable um, because IT is here to stay. It, it is changing rapidly. And we've heard today where MIT is. We would like to go get to where MIT is. Honestly, we do, because that makes us a, a competitor in the marketplace. And we owe that to our region. We have to grow. We have to expand. And at the same time, uh, we are grounded here. Uh, so USP is kind of um, a sounding board where we are grounded, but we are also um, in touch with the international community, with our, with our um, uh, stakeholders and... Um, we, we owe that to our people. We owe that to, 
to our students to have that um, focus and yet have look out into to, uh, to the international community. And that's why we've got MIT here today, because that's where we want to be. We owe that to our people and to the region. Thank you. Thank you I'm very much. Sorry, just to add to that very quickly, um, the, the student or the graduate of USP uh, having a holistic growth is not about the academic program alone. It's about the whole, whole experience that the student has. And every, all of us who've gone through USP know that we earn a lot of the other aspects of Pacific consciousness, making friendships, understanding and appreciating cultures, comes outside of the actual formal curriculum. So I just want to assure students that if it's not taught in the classroom, doesn't mean that we're ex not experiencing it. And with that, I think we, uh, we're running out of time. So I would like to uh, ask us to uh, put our hands together for the, for, for the very good panel discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a break now for lunch, and I hope everybody's going to be able to make it back to listen to the students' side of the uh, argument or the discussion. And can we please start promptly at 1.30, so uh, have about 50 minutes for lunch. So 1.30 prompt start, please, this afternoon. Thank you.